September 2010, and a crowd gathers on a remote hillside in Sussex to pay their respects to Indian war heroes. Incredibly, more Indians volunteered to fight for Britain in the First World War than all the Scots, Welsh and Irish combined. And of that number, up to a third of the soldiers were Sikhs, despite making up just a fragment of India's population. The Sikhs had always been soldiers. They'd had to be soldiers because to survive, uh, they had to fight. In this week of remembrance, this is the little-known story of the Sikhs who answered Britain's plea for help in two world wars. The contribution that Sikh airmen make during the Battle of Britain is a very key contribution. I was dragged out of the aircraft, people saying, oh, he's still alive, he's still alive. They helped save Britain from Nazi tyranny. We wanted to fight against Hitler because we wanted democracy. And laid down their own lives for this country's freedom. German regiments, uh, seeing Sikhs who were fighting against them, uh, running out of ammunition, taking out their swords and marching towards them. And we discover why the modern-day British Army is so keen to recruit young Sikhs. You know, in the Army, we promote integrity, you know, courage, discipline. Let them things are part of our religion. To discover why the youngest of the world's great religions radically transformed from largely peaceful origins into a warrior brotherhood, we have to delve back 500 years. The Sikh way of life started in 1469 uh, with the birth of our first Guru, Guru Nanak Dev Ji. We have to recognize God and love God in all. That's one of the teachings of Guru Nanak Dev Ji. But by the 17th century, the serenity of the Sikh faith was under threat from India's then rulers, the Mughals. The first five gurus, the uh, first five teachers, did not bear arms. But the following five did bear arms. Mughal state executes at the beginning of the 17th century the fifth guru. And there's felt to be a need to change the nature of the community as a result of that. You have two courses, you can either bend to their will or, or stand up and, and, and be counted and actually fight against the suppression and the persecution. That fear of persecution led to the evolution of a warrior identity and with the accession of the tenth and final guru, Gorbin Singh, it cemented itself as a form of pure Sikhism known as the Khalsa. The Khalsa is a group of men who are initiated into this group and have to keep on their bodies a set of symbols which have very much uh, to do with military status and military power and which mark out initiated Sikh men. As well as a commitment to remain faithful to Sikh teachings, the Khalsa vowed to take up arms to defend themselves and others against persecution. And at the end of the 17th century, Gorbin Singh proclaimed that when all other means have failed, it is righteous to draw the sword, giving rise to a concept known as Saint Soldier. A Sikh is supposed to be a Saint Soldier, like uh, in, the, in their life, that you not only uh, do you meditate in prayer and show the kindness and willness to God, but you also uh, uh, oppose oppression. During the 18th century, Sikh armies proved their fighting power with key victories and conquests in their native Punjab. But a new foe emerged in the mid-19th century as the British Empire extended east. The Sikhs had always been soldiers. They'd had to be soldiers because to survive, uh, they had to fight. They had to fight to survive. If they didn't defend their way of life, it would disappear. Um, the British, in 1848, after the Sikh Wars, um, like many of our best soldiers, uh, it all start, we start off by going to war with them. Uh, and then we, the war finishes and both sides reckon that actually the other side is really quite good chaps after all. The British view was it was much better to have the Sikhs on our side uh, than fighting against us. And so it was only a short step uh, to the British saying, look, we've been enemies in the past, uh, but actually there's more between us than divides us. Um, come and work for us. With the Punjab annexed, the British harnessed the Sikh army's power to strengthen its hold across India aided by an anthropological approach to managing differences among their Indian subjects. 
the Marshall Race Theory. The Marshall Race is, um, in the British conception, it's a community of people that had uh, a very kind of specific military ability uh, and they identified the Sikhs, the Gurkhas, various other races in India that they believed were martially skilled, militarily skilled and they admired these and tried to recruit them into the British Army. After the Anglo-Sikh Wars there was a specific attempt to get Sikhs into the British Army. Once they had been baptised and taken an oath to Sikhism they knew that the Sikh once in, on, on, on a battlefield he would fight till the end so uh, there was that loyalty to the banner they were fighting under. By the early 20th century, the Sikhs' homeland, Punjab, was providing over half the troops used in the British Indian Army, despite Sikhs making up just 1% of the country's population. And with the onset of the First World War, Britain found it had a useful new source of war conscripts. The British Army went across to France in 1914. It took a huge number of casualties. The only army that could reinforce it, the only army that was almost as big as the British Army and was regular and properly trained and experienced was the British Indian Army. And very, very early, in, in uh, as early as September 1914, Indian troops were moving from India by sea uh, over to France, coming up and taking their place in the line on the Western Front. For many Sikhs, bravery on the battlefield was in itself an honourable act. In a letter home, a soldier fighting on the Somme wrote, it is quite impossible that I should return alive. Don't be grieved at my death because I shall die arms in hand, wearing the warrior's clothes. This is the most happy death that anyone can die. Well, by the sheer numbers of the Sikhs that fought, I mean, 100,000 men is, is, is a great boost to any campaign. And um, on top of it, the bravery that these Sikh uh, soldiers showed some campaigns at some battlefields, the complete regiments were exterminated because mm -hmm. they fought to the end. One particular story of a, of a, of, of a German regiment uh, seeing Sikhs who were fighting against them, uh, running out of ammunition, and all of a sudden taking out their swords and marching towards them you know, in a rage. So they actually commended this courage that, that they saw. <laughs> of the, um, the Sikh soldiers fighting um, in the Eastern or the Western Front was covered by, by all the newspapers worldwide, French papers and American papers, uh, mainly to show their flamboyant and colourful uniforms as well and, and, and appearance, uh, but at the same time showing that the Sikh soldiers had rallied and come to fight under the banner of the British Empire. We've got some lovely images showing them marching through the streets and the local French crowds greeting them, throwing flowers, and this wasn't just because this was an oriental figure marching through the streets of Paris, but really there was gen genuine um, love and genuine affection that you know, these Sikh soldiers had come to save them. In 1916, the Germans made audio recordings of Sikh prisoners of war captured on the Western Front and only handed the tapes to the British Library earlier this year. In this harrowing recording, 24-year-old Marl Singh tells of his own tragic predicament. Sikh soldiers were deployed in the harsh European trenches, like Jermal Singh Johal's grandfather, Manta Singh. The war broke in 1914 and his regiment was sent to Europe. The conditions were very rough, I mean, uh, uh, trenches and, of course, in Europe, when the uh, winter comes in, you can well imagine it's snow, rain and uh, mud everywhere. This is my grandfather, Subhadamanta Singh. Looking at the size of the tear one, uh, it uh, makes the soldiers look at least about six inches taller than his normal height. And next to him is Captain Henderson. His senior officer, Captain Henderson, got wounded and he went to save him. 
And while he was bringing him back in the wheelbarrow, he got shot in his leg. And he was brought to hospital in Brighton. A royal palace in Brighton, although designed with Eastern pretensions, was still an unlikely setting for a military hospital to house wounded Indian soldiers. We're now approaching the music room, which is uh, one of the most popular and one of the most vividly decorated rooms in the Royal Pavilion. And like many of the rooms in this building, it was used as a hospital ward for Indian men. Now, strikingly, this room is perhaps one of the less peaceful rooms in terms of its decoration, and one can see the rather vivid snakes and the dragons that adorn the wallpaper, etc. It's a very unusual place to have a hospital, and you know, one can't help but wonder what the wounded men felt in their beds, lying down, looking up at these uh, very vivid, almost sort of martial images they saw around them. Over 4,000 injured Indian soldiers were brought to the Royal Pavilion, and many were surprised by the opulence of their new surroundings. Certainly the letters we have from the Indian soldiers themselves indicate that they were very, very honoured by the fact that they were given space to actually recuperate in a, in a royal palace as they saw it, which was also augmented by the fact that King George V made two visits here in January and August 1915. The care the Sikh soldiers received in Brighton led to a strong sense of personal duty to King George V. In a letter home, one Sikh soldier wrote, May God grant long life to the generous-hearted sovereign who has deigned to think of his humblest soldiers. In the First World War, when this building was used as an Indian military hospital, this room was not used for as a kitchen at all, but it was used as an operating theatre. And there were over 70 operations conducted here that we know of. As a thank you for the manner in which the injured troops were looked after, a new gateway to the Royal Pavilion was donated by a Sikh Maharaja on behalf of the Indian people. But for Mantha Singh, there would be no recovery at the hospital and no return to his homeland. Saving the life of his captain led to the tragic loss of his own in 1915. My grandfather was only 27 years old. And of course, leaving two small kids back in India it was difficult for grandmother to bring them up. The outcome of the First World War, the early stages of it, uh, certainly without the Indian Army contribution, and of course Sikhs were a large part of that contribution, I think the war might have been very, very different. Uh, the Indian Army contingents arrived uh, during the First Battle of Ypres, uh, just in time and in just enough numbers uh, to block the gaps. They certainly saved the British from what might have been an embarrassing retreat back to the Channel ports. The Sikh and Hindu soldiers who died at the Royal Pavilion were cremated at this spot, just outside Brighton, now known as the Shatri Memorial. They were all part of a death toll, which by the end of the conflict numbered over nine million lives. Certainly in the award of gallantry medals, the Sikhs were certainly overrepresented, not only in Victoria Crosses, but in other gallantry medals as well. But any Sikh soldiers who'd hoped that their loyalty during the war would be rewarded with greater autonomy back in their homeland were in for a shock. Within months of the war's end, Britain reverted Punjab back to martial law under a repressive regime, which reached its nadir in April 1919 in the Sikhs' holiest city. British military orders led to the shooting of 1,500 unarmed men, women and children at Jallianwala Bagh for taking part in a peaceful demonstration against British rule in what became known as the Amritsar Massacre. They'd fought as a voluntary force for uh, and for, for another country, for a, for a campaign which didn't affect them, and uh, this is how they were treated. So they, they, there, was, there was betrayal and they felt cheated. By the start of the Second World War, Anglo-Indian relations were increasingly fraught due to the rapidly growing independence movement, leaving many Indians facing a dilemma of loyalty. 
Nevertheless, India's Sikhs, Hindus and Muslims again answered the British distress call with over two and a half million signing up for action, the largest volunteer army in history. India is in arms, training troops as fast as they can be trained. Latest reports show that 80,000 men a month are joining the Indian Army. The Sikh contribution to the Second World War was exceedingly important. They probably formed about a quarter of the combat units of the, of the Indian Army. So that they were in tanks, uh, they were infantry, there was Sikh artillery, so huge contribution. And behind the lines of troops and forming a solid bond with them, a teeming population of workers, young and old, are making the weapons of war for their countrymen to wield. It's very key for the Allies, particularly in the West, to have the numbers that they need uh, to hold back the German advance in North Africa and to push up Italy um, towards the heartland of Europe. So the, the contribution that Sikh soldiers make and the contribution that Sikh airmen make during the Battle of Britain in particular, where every single pilot counts, is a very key contribution. In the summer of 1940, the German Luftwaffe's bombs pummeled Britain's towns and cities in a bid to hammer Britain into submission. Millions of fire bombs rained down on the great city of London. In a matter of minutes, more than 1,500 different sections of the city burst into roaring flames. Flames that swiftly merged into the greatest fire in recorded history. Britain sent out a plea for foreign pilots to help defend the country from the threat of Nazi invasion, and Indian fighter pilots were among those who flew to the rescue. One of the first to sign up was a young Sikh, moved by the plight of the British people. I took part in the operations against uh, the Germans in Europe. London was being bombed day and night. Uh, it was almost every day a scene of fire. So then I felt that I was fighting for the right cause. England was alone in 1940, and we, we had hardly any defense. So that was the time when I started feeling that we have to sort of fight for survival. And that was the reason that I continued to fight for the next four or five years. Whenever I traveled to Uxbridge from London Central, we had to take the underground Piccadilly line. And I would find the platforms full of people. There was hardly any space even for us to get into the train and come out. Their plight was really pitiable at that stage. So we have to fight to win the peace. Bougie soon found that the combination of a turban and RAF wings made him a popular figure in wartime London. People here had never seen an Air Force officer with a turban. And wherever I went, they felt very sort of uh, obliged. They said, oh, you're fighting for us. I stood in a cube. Uh, trying to see the Gone with the Wind film. That was a long week queue. I stood at the back, and as soon as I, the man in front of me, uh, me looked at me, he says, Sir, you don't have to queue. I mean, no. and when I went to the ticket counter, the girl there, she said, You don't have to buy a ticket, sir. You can go in. I wrote to my father, I says, no one could better place to die than a place here. See, because these are the people who love me and respect me. 
That affection was reciprocated as Buji spent the next five years flying dangerous fighter sweeps that saw him cheat death on several occasions. In one of my encounters with the German ME, I suddenly saw my dashboard smashed. See, what obviously had happened, aircraft behind me had fired without my knowing it. Black smoke from the engine started coming. Oil started coming out. I couldn't do anything except to try and return home. At about 8,000 feet, I was, I thought I wouldn't make it. And then I saw the white cliffs of Dover. Oh, I was so happy about it and continued to glide. And I just crashed onto the ground. I was dragged out of the aircraft. People saying, oh, he's still alive, he's still alive. I could hear them, but I had my eyes closed because of the fire. Despite suffering serious head injuries, Buji was back in the pilot's seat and protecting Britain from Nazi attack just weeks after the crash. The Battle of Britain was won, but not by Hitler. Buji survived being shot down three more times, and by the end of the war, he'd risen to squadron leader and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross Medal for his heroics in the air. Without the Indian Army, Italy would have been very difficult. Without the Indian Army, the Burma campaign could not have been fought, or if it had fought, we would have lost. No Indian Army, no Far East campaign. We wanted to fight against Hitler also, and against Japanese also. And uh, because we heard stories at that time in schools also, our teachers was telling us that uh, these uh, Japanese are like this, Germans are barbaric, <laughs> yes, and so we were actually against them because we wanted democracy or human rights. For many of the Sikh soldiers, it was their faith that helped sustain them through difficulties on the battlefield. In the morning, we used to pray, always. Everybody went from the tents or outside also, anywhere when we were in the army. We were praying for that, uh, so we should win this war and uh, God save us. By the end of World War II, an estimated 400,000 British soldiers had lost their lives and 36,000 Indians died fighting alongside them. Sikhs were again overrepresented in terms of valour, with four Victoria Crosses amongst an impressive medal hall. One of the things that's happened since the end of empire is that um, it's become difficult or fraught uh, to recognise more broadly the contributions that imperial and commonwealth troops and airmen and sailors uh, made to the war effort. Um, part of that actually, I think, comes from the need in Britain uh, to create a national myth to re replace the uh, myth of Britain as uh, the bedrock of a great empire. An idea, I think, has grown up in people's minds that it was we what defeated the Germans. And um, that narrative, of course, uh, leaves out the Indians and um, all of those groups that made up these armies, including the Sikhs. In the decades after the war, the British Army's ranks benefited from Punjabi immigration into Britain, and today the Sikh military tradition continues to flourish on British soil. Last year, two young Sikhs were selected to guard the Queen, and via a unique new initiative, the Army has begun recruiting in the very heart of one of the largest Sikh communities in Europe, Southall. The Gurdwara project, a collaboration between the British Army and Southall Sikh Temple, has already led to a number of young Sikhs signing up for the armed forces. Morning, gentlemen. My name's Warrant Officer Steve Mack. 
We're just here to give you information about different trades in the army. That's fine. That's fine. We've come into the community to uh, show the Sikh community what jobs we have on offer. So hopefully it would inspire them to join the British Army. It's the heritage the Sikhs have with the British Army, you know, what, the, what they've given in the First World War and the Second World War. It's not just the Sikh community, it's all the communities, the Muslim community, the Hindu community, you know, having a diverse army. There's Sikhs fighting in, in every conflict that's going on at the moment. Me and my brother we served together in Afghanistan, and my mum was a bit worried, but at the end of, end of the day, she'd been a Sikh and Sikh mum, and she was really proud of us, like that we are doing something for the country. We would like to thank the army, they give us opportunity for the last two years. They come here every, every, uh, every other weeks to recruit uh, the, our youngster. So uh, we always encourage the youngster to join the army because I know it. My background is from the army as well. The Sikh tradition with the British Army goes back a long way, uh, and you know we live in Great Britain. Therefore, you know we are proud to represent in the, in the forces. My granddad was in the army. Um, my wife, um, she's in the army. She's in the Royal Logistics Corps. You know, in the army, we promote integrity, you know, courage, discipline. Them things are part of our religion. We've had 85 Sikhs uh, recruited through the Gurdwara project. So hopefully it should go nationwide. While the current British army continues to forge links with the Sikh community, one Sikh war hero will sadly no longer be around to bear witness to his role in its past. On the 19th of September of this year, squadron leader Mahinder Singh Bhuji, the last known surviving World War II Indian fighter pilot, passed away at the age of 92. Just one week later, at the Shatri Monument in Sussex, a new memorial was unveiled listing the names of each of the Indian soldiers who were cremated there during the First World War. My lords, honoured guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inauguration of the Patcham Down Indian Forces Cremation Memorial. We can finally acknowledge these soldiers by name. This memorial is a testament to this country, a country whose freedom these brave and foreign soldiers fought and died for. It tells us that even after all those years, we as a nation have not forgotten them. In honour of his grandfather, the late Subedar Manta Singh, who is cremated here and whose name appears on this memorial, Jamal Singh Johal. This memorial and the fighting of the Indian soldiers is indicative of the relationship between India and uh, Britain which has existed for a few hundreds of years. And um, it's important that both cultures recognize that they fought hand in hand. It's an important aspect of history that hasn't been given it the respect that I think it deserves. They made a huge contribution. For Jamal Singh Johal, whose grandfather Manta Singh died saving the life of his captain, the new memorial ends a lifelong quest to gain recognition for his courage. I'm feeling emotional plus very proud that at least we can see his name inscribed on the panel. A lot of these soldiers and airmen are, are, are very rapidly passing away now, uh, and the few that are left are, are very old now. So it's important to, to actually put down their experiences now before we lose it totally. I always get uh, very grumpy when I see the Sikh running the corner shop uh, who is not treated with, with respect because his father, and certainly his grandfather, fought for this nation. And if he's not the grandson of a soldier, he's certainly the nephew of one. They, these are fighting people. These are people who have contributed to our history and what we've done. Uh, treat them with respect.